efficiency than what you are facing with negotiator of the Department of Safety, Honourable Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the Mota East Tier Reduction Committee, in collaboration with the Institute for University Studies, here I thank Professor Roger Koch, Director of the Institute, and for this collaboration between USEC and the Institute. I welcome you to this indeed um, uh, memorable opportunity to have with us uh, such an eminent person as Minister Barbis, who will be uh, speaking, as you know from your invitation, about creating a common future need for a visionary Europe. We are all familiar with the themes relating to Turkey's relations with Europe and with the European Union. As we all know that um, most of us will be familiar with the fact that uh, Turkey actually applied to join the European Economic Community just after the founding of the European Community and then eventually um, signed a treaty of association which already envisaged uh, the, the possibility, actually the, the promise that uh, Turkey would become a part of the community. And now Turkey is in the process, it is negotiating, and in fact, Minister Barkis is the chief negotiator of this country uh, in these negotiations with the with the Union. Well, uh, just a brief word of introduction uh, about our two speakers. Uh, we are, most of us are familiar with Minister Borch. He has been Minister of Foreign Affairs, of course, now for, uh, for the past four years. Having uh, served in a cabinet position since 1995. Uh, most of his uh, cabinet role has been taken up with home affairs. However, in uh, 2008, he was uh, entrusted with the foreign affairs portfolio. Having been, of course, also um, nominated as deputy prime minister um, after having been elected deputy leader of the Nationalist Party in March 2004. Besides being active and having been active in politics from a very early age, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Borch is also a lecturer in public law at the University of Malta and he is, of course, a lawyer by profession. Um, uh, Minister Bajis has been in uh, the national parliament in Turkey now since 2002, uh, being a deputy representing the city of Istanbul. He was first appointed as Minister for EU Affairs, State Minister and Chief Negotiator in January 2009. His appointment was reconfirmed in 2011 uh, in the 61st Government of the Turkish Republic. Uh, Minister Bajis holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Human Resource Management as well as a Master of Public Administration degree, both, both from Bernhard, Bernard uh, Baruch College at the City University of New York. Besides, uh, before um, uh, being entrusted with ministerial responsibility, Mr. Bajis served as uh, Vice Chairman in charge of Foreign Affairs and Representative Offices of the AK, the Justice and Development Party of, Party of Turkey. He has been for a long time a member of the Central Executive Committee of his party and a Foreign Policy Advisor to Prime Minister Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey. He has also uh, been, a, he is also a patron of the arts and Hence the, uh, the, the, the honor to have him here in Valletta, which is so rich in, in culture and the arts. Having contributed to two major projects, Istanbul 2010 European Capital of Culture and Istanbul 2012 European Capital of Sport. Of course, we hope, Minister, that Valletta will be European Capital of Culture 2018. But currently, uh, preparations are underway for, for a successful uh, application for that bid. Um, he is also a founder of the Global Affairs Platform at Istanbul uh, Bilgi University and chairman of the advisory committee of the platform. He is also a founding member of the Istanbul Center in Brussels and currently a member of the administrative board of the center. So, um, as you see, we have a lot to hear from our two speakers. The first, uh, I first give the floor to, to Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of, Affairs, of Foreign Affairs, Tony Borch will introduce the, the team of the section. Thank you very much, Fanny. Honourable Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure today to welcome the Honourable Benjamin Bajis, Turkish Minister for European Union at first, and I knew even before he was appointed as Minister, and also, another important role, Chief Negotiator in Turkey's accession talks with the 
Union. I am delighted that earlier today we had the opportunity to discuss not only our strong bilateral relationship, but also our interaction on the international stage, particularly with regards to the European Union and the Mediterranean. I am of course also delighted to be introducing the Honourable Minister to you, distinguished guest, before his remarks on the process of Turkish membership of the, of the European Union. I am sure we are all eager to learn more about Turkey's own perspective on its relationship with the Union. For us members of the European Union, we sometimes forget the ties which this same Union has had with countries on its periphery. Ties which, as in the case of Turkey, go back decades. In fact, relations between Turkey and the then EDC, as Van has just said, began in 1959, shortly after the signing of the Treaty of Rome, with discussions evolving on the establishment of an association agreement. This agreement, which eventually became known as the Ankara Agreement and was signed in 1963, was in actual fact the community's first contractual agreement with a third country and laid the groundwork for the evolution of relations between the two sides. Since then, there have been many developments, admittedly sometimes in fits and starts, but still moving forward, as in, to give one example, the establishment of a customs union in 1995, which followed up on Turkey's application for membership of the Union some eight years earlier. <coughs> Accession negotiations, as you all know, were subsequently launched with the precise goal being actual accession. In fact, I remember when we had our own discussion as to whether we should join the European Union or not, reference was made to the fact that the only association agreement, which makes a specific reference to membership, eventual membership of the European Union, was the one with Turkey, because not even the one with Malta, signed in 1970, in spite of our insistence and lobbying to have a similar clause to the one in the Turkish Association Agreement, not even our Association Agreement of 1970 contained such a clause. Now, Turkey, as you well know, is also a widely recognized key regional and global power. Its deep involvement in events shaping North Africa and currently in the Syria issue, speaks for itself. At such a momentous time, it is worth highlighting the central role, the incredible soft power that Turkey can wield, to be an example of a strong Islamic state that works within a democratic framework. Its multidimensional foreign policy and strategic positioning between East and West between Europe and Asia is its strength and gives its strength. It has used and continues to use its growing power proactively in various dimensions, from North Africa to the Middle East, from the Caucasus to Afghanistan, from NATO to the United Nations. To Turkey's credit, it is not just geopolitics and strategy that are working in its favor. Turkey's economy has been going strong for a few years now, hovering, I believe, around the 8% in GDP growth last year. In the current financial and economic situation of most countries around the world, that is nothing but remarkable. Turkish economic leadership in the region is a strong force that stimulates progress elsewhere. The lion's share of this credit rests with generations of Turks, who through sheer hard work and ingenuity made this, this possible. Turkey is also recognized as a crucial energy hub, not least by the European Union. There can be no doubt that in economic terms, Turkey's accession would stimulate trade and investment. On the other hand, Turkey's accession also makes geopolitical sense. The strategic thinking behind Turkish accession remains as valid as ever. As I told the minister this morning, if Turkey is Western enough to form part of NATO and European enough to be a founder member of the Council of Europe, it is European enough 
to be part of the European Union. It is a core interest for the European Union to have a stable, prosperous and democratic Turkey. Turkey brings a new perspective to the European Union, increasing its capacities in the eyes of the world. It also brings new values, new ideas and new points of view that can only make the Union richer. For sure, there are still areas that need reform, and the progress and the process seems long and arduous. Malta can certainly understand the frustrations that the accession process and takes. It took us 14 years between applying and actually joining. However, our experience has been nothing but positive. Ladies and gentlemen, Malta's success in planning for and implementing the reforms necessitated by the accession process can serve as a model for other states currently following their own part of the European Union. Despite its small size and population, Malta has successfully met the requirements for full integration into the Eurozone and the Schengen area. It has bolstered its standing not only in Europe but also internationally. Indeed, our experience has been that our accession to the European Union has not dwarfed our relationship with neighboring countries, including the Arab world. On the, on the contrary, it has strengthened it. Our presence in the European Union has given us more clout in our relationship with our neighbors and with the Arab world. While Malta's strategic location has long enabled the country to assume a geopolitical and economic importance that far outstrips its size, European membership has given Malta an added value a great relevance despite itself. However, this is not only due to the intrinsic composition of the European Union itself, its programs, funds or work, or workers, but also due to the fact that the Maltese have for long been accustomed to looking beyond their borders. The so to speak curiosity has pushed the Maltese to establish relations with others and to seek partnerships everywhere. Our contribution to the European Union has made us a valued partner, and I am sure this is recognized by me, including Turkey. It is of course worth mentioning here the strong bilateral relationship that exists between Malta and Turkey. Since we established formal diplomatic relations in 1967, this relationship has continued to grow in leaps and bounds, and we are very pleased today to have the presence of a Turkish embassy in Malta. These relations are excellent, as demonstrated not only by the numerous high-level exchanges and bilateral agreements, but also by the exchanges that take place in, for example, the tourism and maritime sectors, for which there is certainly ample scope for growth. It is a relationship built on complementary views and ambitions, and which I am certain will continue to grow in the future. Our ties are not only historical, but also contemporary, Mediterranean and European, friendly and firm. It is Malta's view, in conclusion, that a democratic and stable Turkey is important for Europe, just as Europe is important for Turkey. It is Malta's desire to work even more closely with Turkey in an ever-changing world and to encourage it in fulfilling its destiny. As we face similar challenges, but equally similar opportunities, Malta and Turkey will continue working as partners side by side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. Now it is my pleasure and honour to invite Minister Bacis to speak on creating a common future need for a vision for Europe. Thank you, and Honourable Deputy Prime Minister George, my good friend Antonio, dear ambassadors, distinguished colleagues. I'm the first Turkish minister to visit Malta officially after opening our embassy. I'm very honoured today to be the guest of my good friend Antonio. As he mentioned, our relationship, our personal relationship goes back to days before I assumed the role of chief negotiator 
in Turkey, but I'm very happy that I could visit this great and beautiful country today. Our bilateral relations go back several centuries. Throughout history, Turks and the Maltese have learned to respect each other. And today, we are in great cooperation, especially vis-a-vis -vis European Union. Malta is one of the countries that supports Turkey's EU ambitions in a bipartisan manner, with support of the government and the opposition. And what's more interesting is, Malta is not ashamed to admit that. Malta is very proud of the fact that it supports Turkey's EU ambitions, because Malta has a vision for Europe, has a vision for peace. Countries that had their share of war and tear and problems have more appreciation and work harder to ensure peace. Peace is very important as we see with the recent developments taking place around the world. And if you consider what European Union is, as far as I'm concerned, it's not even a political union, forget about being an economic union. It's the grandest peace project of the history of mankind. Countries who are members of the EU today have centuries-long wars among themselves. But today, we can see the Brits and the French living happily ever after, the Italian and the Germans getting along, the Dutch and the Belgians cooperating in many issues. So European Union has been one of the most influential, grandest peace projects of the history of mankind. Turkey's membership of the EU would evolve this continental peace project to become a global peace project. And I think this is why Malta very publicly supports Turkey's EU ambitions as well. Before I continue with my remarks, I want to thank my good friend Tony Obor for his great hospitality. I really enjoyed our meeting, our conversation, our lunch, and I am looking forward to coming back again. The reason I say it, three years ago, well, a little bit more than three years ago, I had made two promises to Tony. I had promised to come to Malta, which I had delivered, fulfilled. My second promise is to bring my Prime Minister, which I intend to do very soon. So we will be coming back, hopefully with Prime Minister Erdogan. But I want to remind us of a statement by a very wise man, Mahatma Gandhi, who once said, future depends on what you do today. If we really want European Union to be a platform for international peace, to be a platform for alliance, not clash of civilizations, I think Turkey's membership aspirations become much more evident. Today, Turkey is not Turkey of 1959, which had applied to EU membership. Back then, Turkey had a per capita income of $400. Today, we are richer than eight member states per capita wise. Those days, we had 14 universities. Today, we have more than 200 universities. For the last five years, we have been the fastest growing economy in Europe. Our Annual growth rate last year was 8.5%. The year before was 8.9%. The year before that was around 8%. Turkey is doing phenomenally good. But more importantly, we will, be con we will continue to do good, according to OECD. Turkey would be among the top three growing countries with China and India until at least 2020. One of the reasons for the continuation of the growth is of our young population. At a time when the European average age is 44, Turkey's median age is 28. I happen to be one of the youngest ministers in Turkish government. But I assure you, 65% of my nation is younger than I am. Turkey is also very strategically located. 
I represent the city of Istanbul, which is the most Asian city of Europe and the most European city of Asia. It's where East meets West. It's the most Eastern part of the West, most Western part of the East. But within three hours of flying from Istanbul, one can reach 1.5 billion consumers who are ready, willing, and able to use European products and services at the time when Europe needs new markets. One of the upcoming challenges ahead of Europe is the energy crisis. 70% of the energy resources Europe needs are either to the south, north, or east of Turkey. So unless someone invents a new wireless technology of energy distribution, <coughs> Turkey's cooperation is a must to solve European energy supply and security. Turkey is a very important ally for European nations. We have the mightiest military in Europe, the second largest in NATO, and we have been a member of NATO for more than 60 years, as my good friend Antonio said. We have fought together in Korea, in Kosovo, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Bosnia, in all of the difficult parts of the world. As a matter of fact, sometimes my constituents in Istanbul ask me, how come we were good enough to to go and die for values like democracy and human rights in NATO, but today some question Turkey's Europeanness or Turkey's being fit to live with the same values under EU. And it's a very challenging question to answer. But I also have to admit, yes, Turkey has a lot to promise to Europe, but Europe has a lot to promise to Turkey because this is a relationship based on a win-win platform. Today's Turkey is much richer compared to Turkey of 1959 that first applied. But today's Turkey is much more democratic as well, much more transparent, much more self-confident. To cite a few good things, if not great, that Turkey has achieved in the last 10-15 years using the EU platform, one would understand why it's so vital for us. In a country where people were afraid to admit they were Kurds until 15 years ago, we now have 24 hours of Kurdish broadcasting on state television. Our inmates in prisons can talk to their visiting mothers in their mother tongue in Kurdish language. We have Kurdish departments within our universities. The Christian Greek Orthodox community started having masses at the historical Sumala Monastery in the Black Sea coast of Trabzon after a gap of 88 years. The Armenian community started having masses at the historical Armenian Church of Akdamar after a gap of 112 years. At the time when some leaders in Europe were trying to deport their own citizens of Roma origin, my Prime Minister gathered a meeting last year with 20,000 Turks of Roma origin and announced new housing and career projects. Some of the properties owned by non-Muslim foundations in Turkey, which were disputed since 1930s, were returned to them last year. All these developments have been motivated by Turkey's resolute to become in line with the EU standards. Therefore, when I try to explain what EU is to my own constituents, I always use the argument that this is a relationship of a patient with a dietitian. We all know we have to watch what we eat, and we need to exercise regularly to lead a healthy life. But sometimes seeking the advice of a dietitian helps, because it's always more tempting to eat ice cream or a chocolate cake while watching television on a comfortable sofa, being compared to being on a treadmill and sweating. But one is the right thing to do, the other one is the fun thing to do. EU being Turkey's dietitian has a very good prescription. The prescription is the Aki, 120,000 pages of rules and regulations which have helped 27 countries, including Malta, to come to a better condition. That's what we're implementing right now. The fact that the dietitian himself is overweight 
is moody or has a few clogged arteries doesn't make the prescription bad. The prescription is still the best around. As a matter of fact, despite the economic crisis, per capita prosperity is the highest in EU compared to the rest of the world. And when I say per capita prosperity, I'm not only talking of income. Per capita prosperity includes income plus human rights, plus food safety, plus hygiene, plus oxygen ratio in the air that you breathe. Until two years ago, we did not have any rules or regulations about the standards of toys that our kids play with in Turkey. Now we do, because we took it from the EU acquis. <coughs> Companies could manufacture baby food in Turkey without using all organic ingredients. Some of the genetically modified ingredients were even used in baby food manufacturing, but now they can't. Or some of the fuels that generate too much carbon monoxide could be used in city centers. Now only agricultural equipment in rural areas can use that fuel, not in city centers. All that had made Turkey a better country. And we use the guideline, the prescription of EU. That's why I think the process itself is much more important than the end result. Some countries today challenge if Turkey should become a member or not. As Tonio said, it's a question that the Americans would phrase as a day late, a dollar short. Because back in 1963, when Turkey signed the Ankara Agreement, it was noted that Turkey is the first country to push and get that into the agreement, that the goal and the final result of the negotiations is full membership to the EU. As a matter of fact, every country that has ever started their accession negotiations has at the end completed their negotiations. Some, like Malta, have become members after completing the negotiations. Some, like the United Kingdom, have been vetoed after completing their negotiations, but through determination have become members at the end. And some, like Norway, have chosen not to become members after completing their negotiations. But Norway has become a much more self-confident, transparent, and prosperous country having completed those negotiations. So for some countries who think, or some politicians who think they can force Turkey to throw in the towel, are dead wrong. We're not giving up. It took us 45 years just to get a date to start accession negotiations. Our first application, as I said, was back in 1959. We started the process in 2004. If we could be patient enough to wait for 45 years just to get a date, you bet we will continue fighting on this road. Because this is good for Europe, this is good for Turkey, and this is good for international peace. One might ask, why for international peace? What does it have to do? Well, let's look at what's happening today. People who risk their own lives in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, who are still risking their lives in Syria today, are looking at Turkey and see Turkey as a source of inspiration. They look at Turkey and they say, well, look at these Turks. They have a very similar tradition, culture, religion, geography, topography. But they have it. They have a government and an opposition. They have free market economy. They have labor unions. They have freedom of speech. They have a free media. Why can we not have the same? What makes Turkey so unique, despite so many similarities, is the fact that Turkey is a democracy, and that democracy has been strengthened by Turkey's decision Turkey's resolute, Turkey's motivation to become a member of the EU. All the EU reforms have increased the standards of our democracy. So while some narrow-minded politicians in Europe who are so worried about their upcoming elections keep on attacking Turkey's membership aspirations, they're also attacking the dreams of millions of people in the Arab Spring and the Arab Street. That is why, despite all the difficulties, we have to continue doing what's right. The process is more important than the end result. As far as Turkey's contributions are concerned, the most important one is to convert this continental peace project into a global one. But Europe's influence in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, would increase immensely with Turkey's contributions. Every time Madame Ashton, as Tonya would know, goes to the Middle East, 
She calls our foreign minister for consultation. Today, the G8 ministers are <coughs> gathering to discuss what to do about Syria. And because Turkey follows the events in Syria very closely, we have been asked to contribute to that meeting, and our foreign minister will actually attend the meeting through video conference and share Turkey's perspective. We were the first Muslim country to tell Gaddafi that he should go. We were the first to tell Mubarak that he should go. We were the first to tell Assad he should go. Two out of three for the time being is not bad. Eventually it will be three out of three. Because no leader can continue to govern while killing his own innocent citizens. Unfortunately, in Syria today, what we're witnessing is a regime, a government that's bombing its own cities, killing its own innocent citizens. No dictator has survived. They all will have to go. But Turkey will continue to be a source of inspiration in that uh, aspect. Turkey has responsibilities, which Turkey has assumed in NATO, in OECD, in OSCE, in World Bank and many international organizations. And Turkey understands that we also have, will have responsibilities in the EU. As I said, this relationship is based on a win-win platform. There's a lot that Turkey gains and there's a lot that Europe gains. We are a full member of every European organization, except for EU, for the time being. We are in UEFA, we are in Eurovision, we are in European Investment Bank, we are in European Defense and Security Projects. And it's only natural for Turkey to be in Europe as well. After all, the word Europe and the word Paris were names of princes that lived in today's Turkey. We all share a common past, and I can assure you, we all have a common future as well. We share the same history, we share the same geography, we share the same vision, same values, and therefore we have a common destiny. We all have to work together. So rather than turning this into a monologue, let's turn this into a dialogue and give our listeners a chance to ask questions, make comments, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, have this exchange of views with, with, with uh, members of the public who are present here today. Mm -hmm. um, please, uh, I do appeal to people who wish to intervene to state who they are and uh, if they are here yeah, representing a, an organization to, to identify the organization and to keep their interventions as brief as possible in order to give other persons the possibility. My name is Victor Abela, I'm an ex graduate in uh, European Studies at the Modern University. Way back in 19, uh, no, sorry, in 2005, I was asked to represent my unit in uh, Galatasaray University discussing um, the difficulties which was facing Turkey in uh, being pushed to be a full member state. And uh, I wrote a paper with regards to Germany. I mean, way back, as you know, more than me, when the Germans didn't have enough workers, they um, imported, so to speak, thousands and thirds. Uh, to work in Germany, especially in Berlin. In fact, in uh, part of Berlin, near the X wall, there is a, um, a place in which um, streets are in German and in Turkish. And now I, I see, I am very perplexed how such a country as Germany uh, way back also, um, years ago, um, uh, wanted to push back some of her ex-German Turkish <laughs> citizens by offering money to go back. In fact, today, as I researched, one third 
of the youth population in Berlin are coming from the third generation from Turkey. So it's a contradiction, I, I say, where Germany can push back and push ahead. Uh, Turkey is right, as I see it in my place, to be one of the members full states of Europe. In English we say, peace has affected no less the land than war. And so, that it, solidarity should be made also with Turkey. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your comments. As far as Turks in Germany, we have around 3 million right now. But what's interesting is, in 2010, for example, 27,000 Turks migrated to Germany. However, 35,000 Germans migrated to Turkey. Some of, them are, some of them are reverse migration, Turks or German citizens or Turkish citizens, who are coming back. But some of them are actually the German pensioners, retired German individuals, families, who make a much better living with 900 euros per month of their retirement salary in Turkey, in Alanya, whether, whether it's like Malta, three, uh, you know, sun, sunny 300 days out of a year, compared to Berlin or Munich, where they can hardly make a living with that money, where the weather isn't that so good. So things are changing. Back in 1959, 60, 61, Turkey saw sending its citizens to Europe as workers, as guest workers, as an opportunity. Right now, we are employing people from Europe in so many new projects. As I said, our growth rate is around 8-9% per year, which means we're growing very fast. And for that, we need know-how, technology, workers, engineers, lawyers, scientists, and uh, Turkish EU cooperation is very really important. As a matter of fact, 50% of our trade is with Europe. There are 4,500 approximately German companies functioning in Turkey. We get around 3.5 million Germans who visit Turkey every year as tourists. More than 2 million French citizens come to Turkey every year. 60% of our tourists come from EU. We had 32 million tourists last year. And our tourism income is around 30 million euros, which is very substantial for our economy. 85% of all foreign direct investment in Turkey has come from EU. That amount actually increased to 92% in the year 2011. With the economic crisis in Europe, but the wealth, it had to go somewhere. And where else but Turkey? It's the closest to EU standards. Country of law, democracy, transparency. And so geographically situated. And we're in the customs union since 1996 so we can easily have free trade with all European Union member states. For all those reasons, the biggest impediment between Turkey and EU is prejudice. And we have to work together to eliminate that biggest impediment. And I think we will. But I have to say, it's not Germany who's against Turkey's membership. It's some politicians in Germany who exploit Turkey's aspirations for their local political scene. It's the same for all other countries. It's a unanimous decision that started Turkey's negotiations with the EU. And only a unanimous decision of all 27, soon to be 28 member states can stop this process. <coughs> Minister Bush, um, thank you very much for your words today and welcome to Malta. 
Um, I only come representing myself, but I am here because I'm fascinated by the country of Turkey. I happen to have a Turkish girlfriend, and I'll address you in Turkish only. She's only to me romantic words. You are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, re the question I wanted to ask was, you spoke a lot about how the EU could benefit from Turkey joining the bloc, and I completely agree with all the points that you raised. But now that the EU is in such turmoil economically, it's going through this euro crisis, at best there will be anemic growth for the next five to ten years. And as you mentioned, Turkey's economic growth is, is going through the roof, it's starting to assert itself as a regional power. Um, wouldn't it stand to benefit more? Has Turkey actually started wondering whether now the EU needs Turkey more than Turkey needs the EU? And you know, perhaps it may, would make more sense for Turkey to remain independent as a stakeholder within the region and uh, assert more uh, assert more authority in that way. That's a very commonly asked question, and it has its merits. I thank you for that question. But as I mentioned in my remarks, I don't see the European Union as an economic union. Therefore, the economic crisis is not, does not bother me. Because we have seen worse, and Europe has seen worse. Europe has, has seen some fascist dictators that really ruined lives of millions of people. As far as economic crises are concerned, I remember times back in 1999, not too long ago, where we had 8,000% interest rates among banks overnight. Inflation was skyrocketing. I remember devaluating our money where people's assets were, the value of their assets were halved overnight and their debts doubled overnight. I remember people committing suicide because of economic problems. But those days are behind us. We are now, with the right fiscal policies, with the right government, with the confidence of the market, we, we are now the fastest growing economy in Europe. So difficulties will be resolved. No crisis lasts forever. It's like an airplane. They all land. Sometimes a soft landing, sometimes a softer landing. <laughs> crisis will come to an end, but the European Union will continue to be the grandest peace project of the history of mankind. That's why we are determined to join. And the process of completing the negotiations, the process of doing all these reforms, have been good for us. And we think we can contribute a lot to this process, to Europe. For people in Syria, in Iraq, in Armenia, in Georgia, being neighbors to EU would be very important as well. Because this concept of prosperity and peace and self-respect can be contagious. It can enlarge into larger geographies. That's why we're determined. And once we complete the negotiations, as I said, we might be strongly anchored to the EU like Norway is, but not a member. But it's not a decision that I should make, nor Tony should make today. Because by the time we complete our negotiations, Neither one of us will probably be in our offices. You might end up representing Malta that day and your girlfriend might be representing Turkey that day in that <laughs> setting. You might end up making that decision. But if two of you can get along, why shouldn't we in international platforms work as we do, closer? Absolutely. I, I can add something on this talk because you have twice already mentioned the European Union and described it as a peace project as well. That is to say that nations which used to go to war against each other today form the axis of uh, the European Union, it's the core of the European Union. And sometimes we underestimate this peace element, um, not only in the European Union itself, but even in Schengen. Let's take the Schengen project. And those of you who have not been to Schengen should go, because when you go to Schengen, you immediately realize why Schengen started in Schengen. Um, because this is a very small village. It's even smaller than Balsam, uh, which is part of my constituency. Imagine something smaller than Balsam. 
And uh, it is right at the point where France, Luxembourg, and Germany meet. So the inhabitants of Schengen, each time they had to go for a Sunday outing, if they went to France, they needed a passport, probably needed to exchange money as well. If they went to the other side, they needed a passport as well. And therefore, the idea to remove the internal borders had to start in a place like Schengen. But have we ever realized what this has brought about? I mean, let's take the borders which have always, in the past, not in the faraway past, in the past, created tensions. For instance, in the Sub-Tyrol between Austria and Italy. Few remember that the first interstate action before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg in 1959-1960 was a border dispute between Austria and Italy. Can you imagine today a territorial or border dispute between Austria and Italy? This is only 50 years ago. Why? Because with Schengen, the borders have re remained only on the geographic left. In practice, there are no borders between Austria and Italy and Malta and all those who participate in the Schengen area. Or else in Slovenia, between Slovenia and Italy and Gorizia, Nova Gorizia, I was president with Minister Amato, who was then interior minister, was interior minister at the time as well, when the border between Slovenia and Italy was dismantled.